We live in a relativistic universe, and living in a relativistic universe is really hard. It is actually, oh my gosh, uh, uh, the fact that time is relative and distances are relative and nobody can agree and clocks are asynchronized. This is a very tough concept to, to wrap our heads around. And it's a very hard concept to, to reconcile with our daily experiences. Uh, and so that's why it's best to explore this through stories. And, and check this out, this story. So you've got uh, twins, Alice and Bob. Uh, let's say, I don't know, they're 20 years old. They just celebrated their 20th birthday. And to celebrate, Bob is going to get in a rocket ship and blast off from the Earth and travel at a healthy fraction of the speed of light. You know, what else are birthdays for? So Bob is going to cruise around the galaxy for a while. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how fast he goes. It doesn't matter where he goes. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, how long it takes him. But then eventually he returns to Earth. He's going to find when he returns to Earth that Alice is not quite his twin anymore. If you want some numbers, let's say he's traveling at, I don't know, three fifths the speed of light, and he is gone uh, for 10 years, according to Alice. Uh, and that means he's traveled uh, uh, three light years away. He went three light years away, turned around, came back three light years back. So he traveled for six light years at three fifths the speed of light. According to Alice, he has been gone for 10 years, but according to Bob, he's only been gone for eight. And it's, it's true, like it's, it's not just like perception or impression or, or the feeling of that, you know, like we all have this feeling that time uh, flies or, or time grinds to a halt. No, 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 this is real. Alice is really 30 years old and Bob is really 28 years old at the end of this journey. Alice will have some, some gray hairs and, and you know, a few, uh, like some, some crow's feet showing up here. And Bob is, Bob is just 28, still in his 20s. He's physically 28 years old. If you were to attach uh, a radioactive materials to Bob, probably a bad idea in practice, but, but go with me here. And attach the same radioactive materials to, to Alice, there would have been 10 years worth of decays on, on near Alice and then only eight years worth of decays on Bob. If Bob were to only pack eight years worth of food, he would survive. Even though according to Alice, he has been gone for 10 years. If he only packed eight years worth of food, he would have survived because according to Bob, only eight years have gone by. This is this scenario. This setup is commonly referred to as, as the twin paradox, but we're not at the paradox yet. There is no paradox here that Alice has aged 10 years and Bob is only aged eight. There is no problem here. This is simply a consequence of living in a relativistic universe. I told you it's no fun. It's really hard to, to uh, wrap your head around. It's really hard to reconcile. It's really hard to accept. And even me, I'm literally an astrophysicist. I have a PhD in this stuff. And I've been using relativity and working with relativity. And, and you know, there was decades ago that I did relativity homework problems and it's still hard for me <laughs> to, to just accept that clocks are not synchronized around the universe. That was the old view. That was the Newtonian view. That was the, the classical view of physics that there is this master clock, not a real actual clock out there. It's just, it's, it's, it's conceptual, but that everyone can agree that everyone can synchronize clocks. And then no matter where you are in the universe, what reference frame you have, no matter what you can agree. Uh, yep. We all agree on the same time. It's not the case. This is what we learn in relativity. Instead, in relativity, we learn that we are moving constantly through space-time. In fact, we all move through space-time at the speed of light. And if you're standing perfectly still, you are still moving at the speed of light, but through the dimension of time. You're going into your own future at the speed of light. And as soon as you start moving through space, you have to steal a little bit of that movement through time in order to move through space in this four dimensional framework of space time, which means your rate of passage of time literally slows down. Physics slows down, biology slows down, chemistry slows down, everything slows down. Bob really does only age eight years, even though Alice is age 10. Like I said, that's not the real paradox. This is the real paradox, the actual paradox 
is we've been talking about Alice's reference frame. And in Alice's reference frame, she is standing perfectly still. She is on the Earth. The Earth is large and not moving. I mean, yes, it's orbiting, spinning, all that. We're going we're gonna to skip all that because it doesn't really matter. In her reference frame, she's totally still. Bob is the one who gets in the rocket ship. He flies away. He gets smaller, 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 smaller. And then comes back bigger, 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 bigger. And now he's two years younger than her. What gives? But what about Bob's perspective? Because Bob has a perspective too, all right? And in his perspective, if he is cruising along at constant speed, this is something we call an inertial frame of reference. If he's in an inertial frame of reference, he doesn't know he's moving. There is no experiment that he can perform on board that spaceship to tell them that he is moving at constant speed. Think about if, you, if you're in an airplane and you're cruising along at altitude and you toss a ball, that's an experiment that you're doing something, you're testing some law of physics. You can't tell that you're moving because you throw the ball and, and then you catch it in your hand. How do you know that you're moving? Well, you would say, well, I look out the window and I see the earth rolling by beneath me. Well, how do you know you're not staying still and the earth is rotating underneath you? You don't. You don't. There's no physics experiment that you can perform. You're relying on your intuition that the Earth is large and probably isn't moving to tell you that you're moving, but there's, there's no physics reason why that has to be true. Same for Bob. Bob is flying away in his spaceship, and as long as he's in that inertial frame of reference, Alice is the one, and the whole entire Earth is the one that is accelerating or moving away from him, getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then bigger and bigger and bigger, and then he come, and then it comes back, and then he lands a spaceship. So according to Alice, she has been the still one, the stationary one. Bob has moved, and since he's moving at close to the speed of light, his clock runs slow, and so he has only aged eight years, while Alice is aged ten. But according to Bob's perspective, he's the one who's been stationary, and Alice has been the one who's been moving. So when that reconnect, he should have aged ten years, and she should have aged only eight. This is the twin paradox. If all reference frames are valid and everything is equivalent in these inertial frames of reference, then who is correct, Alice or Bob? I won't spoil it, it's Alice. Alice has the correct perspective because Bob does something funny. Bob doesn't maintain an inertial frame of reference. He doesn't just cruise at one speed forever. No. He goes to his destination, he slows down, he stops, he turns around, he re-accelerates, and then he comes back to the Earth. So he is doing something differently than Alice. He is changing his frame of reference. There is a period of time when he is no longer in an inertial frame of reference, just cruising along at constant speed. He is turning around. And crucially, he is doing these maneuvers in a way that he can tell, he can discover with physics experiments on board his rocket ship. He can feel the vibration of the engine. He can feel himself getting pushed into the floor as the rocket decelerates or accelerates. He can feel it turning around. He can perform experiments that tell him that something special is happening to his frame of reference. And so this breaks the symmetry of the paradox. Alice and Bob no longer have the exact same uh, equal uh, standing of reference frames. Bob now has a very, very different perspective of the universe than Alice. And it's this turnaround, this changing of reference frames. It doesn't matter how long it takes, just the very fact that there is a change in reference frame before Alice and Bob reconnect, that changes the whole scenario. If Bob were to just keep on cruising forever at constant speed in that inertial frame, never stop, never slow down, never speed up, then yeah, him and Alice will disagree about the rate of time and they will disagree about which one of them is the younger of the two. And that's okay because relativity allows people to disagree because the now is never the now, length of time is never the same, everyone is get, gonna disagree anyway, this is just one more thing for people to disagree about, that's fine. But the moment Bob slows down, stops, reverses, and comes back, he is breaking that symmetry, he is no longer on an equal footing with Alice, and what he will find in the, in the mathematics of special relativity actually allows you to explore this and find out exactly what happens uh, when Bob is on his outward journey, 
he will perceive Alice to be uh, aging slower because it looks like she's the one who's moving. But as soon as he turns around and comes back, then Alice will actually appear to age uh, and fast forward and she will catch up and she will make it all the way to 10 years while the passage of time for Bob has only been eight. That is the solution to the twin paradox. But the solution opens up a, a major conceptual headache, not a mathematical headache, the, the mathematics of special relativity, which this entire discussion is based on, are, are crystal clear, which is why mathematics are so awesome. It just tells us exactly what happens. But to, but to think about, pause here for a second. Alice, during this trip, three light years out and back, Alice has aged 10 years. Bob has only aged eight. But Bob's experiences don't run in slow motion. When you're on that rocket ship, or Bob is on that rocket ship traveling at close to the speed of light, it's not like you feel like you're in slow motion. You drop something that goes, Ooh. no, 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 it, it drops normally. Your heartbeat, yeah, 60 beats per minute, yeah, same. You look at your watch, tick, 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 a second takes a second. You, you, nothing changes in your experience. It's not like you move in slow motion and you perceive that slow motion and that you can sense this slow motion time dilation thing operating around you. That's not the case. That's not the case. Bob feels totally normal. So how do we reconcile these perspectives? Alice, her passage of time feels and literally is totally normal. Bob's experiences and literal passage of time are totally normal. Just like I said, if you, if you attach radioactive materials to Bob, it would have only decayed by eight years, not 10. Everything's normal. Nothing feels weird for Bob. Where do those two years go? Alice really did experience 10 years and Bob really, really only experienced eight. But how, but then they meet up together on the earth when Bob lands his rocket ship, what happens? How do we get those two years back? How do we explain the difference? If there's no actual difference in the perceived or experienced flow of time, where do those two years go? Well, the answer is space time. Remember, you can't have time dilation without something else. Movement through time is movement through space, and movement through space is movement through time. We live in a unified four-dimensional framework. You can't just look at the flow of time in isolation. Just like you can't look in, at the movement through space in isolation. You have to look at it in a unified picture. And the other side of the coin of time dilation is a length contraction. Moving clocks run slow. Moving rulers shrink. They look shorter. You take a meter stick and you whiz it by you at close to the speed of light, it will not look like a meter. It will look shorter than a meter. And the, how short it is depends on exactly how fast it's going. This is a real thing. In Bob's perspective, flying close to the speed of light, only eight years goes by. He will only experience eight years. But the distance he traveled will be less. That distant star is not three light years away that he's traveling to. It's only 2.4 light years away. He didn't travel six light years total. He only traveled 4.8 light years. His journey was shorter. His rate of time, as he experienced it, was the same. But he, to him, his distance was shorter. That's why it only took him eight years. That's why he only needed eight years worth of food to do this because he didn't have to go as far as he thought. He's like, oh, that thing's not three light years away. It's only 2.4. Okay, that's easy. You have to uh, compensate for that. You have to examine the whole duality of space and time in order to, to really understand these scenarios. For Alice, 10 years went by and Bob traveled the full six light years. For Bob, only eight years went by, but he didn't have to travel that same distance. He only had to travel 4.8 light years, going three-fifths the speed of light. If he was going faster, then the numbers get even crazier. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, I, this is such a fun concept, exploring the nature of space and time and the unification of space time and exploring these kinds of paradoxes and just weirdness of the universe where no one agrees about lengths of measurements of time and space. And, and that, 
that's awesome on one hand and really frustrating on the other. I hope you enjoyed. Please like, share, and subscribe and go to patreon.com slash pmsutter. There's a link down there. If you like what you're watching, that is the number one best way to support this show. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you next time. Or will I?